right, now I'll try to be brief because uh, Milt has some of the more uh, complex stuff to uh, pr uh, share with you. So I'll try to buzz through my stuff here. But a, a brief history of, of this building site that we're on. The, 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 the church organization uh, here goes back to 1895, so it's quite an old congregation. Uh, but this site started in the late 50s uh, and the early 60s. And you can see uh, the, the footprint of the old building here. And the uh, original round building was phase one. Uh, it, it housed the entire uh, church, sanctuary, offices, classrooms, uh, and it was all chunked up into like little pie chunks. Uh, phase two added an austere uh, rectangle building that's close to Hamden. It's the, actually the building we're in right now. And uh, it was, uh, when I say austere, it was a, uh, you know, a prefab warehouse building, the kind where they bring the pieces and they assemble them on site, goes up in a hurry. Um, phase three uh, in 79 to 80 created an indoor space. Uh, by the way, at that time, you, had, you walked on you know, outdoors to get from the circle building to the rectangle building. And the rectangle building, when I say austere, uh, there were no windows in that building. Um, in uh, 7982 time frame, the uh, two buildings were connected by the space which we now call Friendship Hall. It's still the area that's out there as well. And, uh, uh, and then phase four in 1990-93 added some more offices to the west, uh, it kind of expanded that uh, central area, and then uh, finally added some windows in this building, uh, the windows you see there. So. Um, uh, now, those windows have been replaced in this renovation, but that's the same location that the uh, prior windows were in. Um, the uh, uh, church received green sanctuary status in 2011. Uh, green uh, sanctuary may not mean uh, to everyone what, what it sounds like. It doesn't mean that the building is um, hyper energy efficient necessarily. It means that you're doing your best with the building, but it also means that the uh, members of that congregation make a, an outward commitment to the community and, uh, and kind of at large to, um, uh, be, uh, to, you know, to take on environmental challenges and uh, be uh, basically a uh, proponent of, uh, of, of uh, climate action and environmental uh, uh, goodness. Um, we, uh, we, we've realized for at least 10 years, and, and uh, this sort of reached a peak in the last four years or so, that we were in uh, second or third overtime of, uh, of, of a building upgrade. And I, the, the original design was tired and old. Uh, we had uh, a 1960s roof, a very strange roof that was uh, constantly leaking. Uh, we, uh, we felt the building and its presence uh, were constraining our growth. Um, uh, the common spaces were a bit disjointed. Um, the religious education space, what's actually below us, uh, absolutely felt like a basement. Uh, and um, our, our sanctuary uh, was structured. It didn't have a center aisle. It wasn't very convenient for special events or weddings or things like that. So um, we embarked on a project that we called BFF, Building for the Future. Um, as we began to uh, explore the design and the cost and so forth, uh, every time uh, we revisited those numbers, they went up. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, for some in this congregation, it was like uh, one heart attack after another. Um, and uh, so what, what started off uh, as a three and a half million dollar uh, capital campaign that we actually began raising money for and uh, you know, going for, uh, grew to be about a four and a half million dollar build. Yes, uh, uh, well, I'll keep going here. And so um, the base energy systems of that building uh, were essentially conventional. And we made, we also had a, a group of individuals, including folks like Milt and others that are in the audience here, uh, that felt like it did not make sense for us to spend four and a half million dollars without going the extra mile to make the building net zero and to stop using fossil fuel. So we had to find a way to come up with an additional $475,000 on top of all of that money. And it made the capital project a total of about $5 million. Um, 
So uh, we often think of sustainability and we equate it with energy, but there are really several things that are sustainable about our approach to this renovation. Uh, one was the overall design. Uh, in, in another decade, in another time, this building might have been scraped and a new building would be put here. In fact, what we did is we only enlarged the original footprint of the building by about 20%. And that is the section that is out uh, now to the east, uh, out in the front. Everything else is as it was. Uh, the round section of the building, we, um, uh, we took down to its original foundation. So the original floor, foundation, and basement are there. And then we built a new circular uh, build on top of it. Um, in deconstructing the building, we were careful to recycle and reuse uh, materials like the concrete and the steel. Um, we applied uh, uh, as modern a building science as could be applied in uh, insulation, uh, glazing, uh, uh, lighting, LED lighting, lighting uh, controls, uh, things of that nature. Uh, you'll notice, and when you go on the tour, you'll see a dramatic use of beetle kill uh, wood in the sanctuary and, uh, and in a few other places in the building. Um, and we, uh, wherever we could, such as the carpeting you're standing on, uh, using uh, squares from Interface and, and similar companies, we, we use sustainable carpeting and, uh, you know, choices like that. Um, we, something that has little to do with energy, but it pays a kind of an homage to the sun, and uh, it, it's uh, special for me and for Jonathan Orms, who's uh, visiting with us tonight as well. Uh, we designed and built a solstice window feature uh, that you'll see on, on the tour, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit more as we get a little further on. And, um, and then our energy system, uh, and we made a commitment to have a net uh, zero fossil fuel building. The, uh, uh, one of the things that you all know is that uh, almost everything we do when we do energy efficiency or uh, sustainability is invisible. And we know this building is going to be here for decades uh, in this sustainable mode. So we wanted to be able to remind people uh, of, of the things that went into the walls and onto the roof and under the ground uh, to make the building sustainable. So, these signs are actually out there, they're sort of subtle, but there are about two dozen of them around the building. And so as you walk around, you might notice some of them. And so we have these small signs throughout the building that remind us of, uh, of the kinds of things that we've done that are sustainable in the building. Um, this really has little to do with the um, uh, energy, uh, but we have, uh, put one of our brochures on the table for you to take with you that talks specifically about our geothermal and solar system. But we have a whole series of brochures that our Green First group put together. Uh, we call it our Living Our Values series. And one of the, one of the uh, neat things that we did is we identified a church member who we consider to be the go-to person for that topic. And these are a, a, some example topics. We've also made this in, in a kind of like a toolkit form available in, in PDF and RAW format. So we can give it to, to Jeffco, for example, or we could give it to another church. We've uh, talked to uh, Interfaith Power and Light uh, about making this as a toolkit that they can give to other churches and they can create similar brochures and identify someone in their congregation that's the go-to person for solar or for um, uh, local, buying local food or something of that nature. Um, uh, I, I'm going to take a moment and talk about the solstice window feature. Uh, you'll see more of it here than you can see live in, on the floor out there. But um, uh, in one of our early meetings when we arrived at the design for a circular uh, congregation uh, in there, uh, Jonathan Orm suggested that uh, it would be a neat feature to install a solstice light. And I was in that meeting. Uh, I was on that committee and I instantly loved that idea. And so I went home and I Googled uh, what, uh, where would I go to get a solstice light and, or a solstice window. And I immediately learned that there's no such thing and there's nothing you can Google. Um, most of the uh, examples of that are in ancient uh, buildings where you know, something was lined up so the sun makes a shaft of light go down a, an old building or something like that. So we were on our own. 
And so we designed something that uh, is workable and it's fun and, uh, and it's interesting. And so uh, it's, um, the, the architects provided me a 22-inch um, square skylight in what we call the oculus. It's the center of the round part of the building. And uh, this is what you'll see when you go in there. Um, and those three tubes bring light in on the um, uh, summer solstice, winter solstice, and the two equinoxes. Uh, in, in the, and this is what is the part that you can't see. That's what's up in the ceiling. So there are three tubes in there, each at uh, the correct angle, so that uh, in the winter, when the sun is low, it goes through the most slanted tube, and it brings a blue light down to the floor for about an hour during the day for about two or three weeks around the solstice. And the uh, middle tube is, are the equinoxes, and the uh, most upright tube is the summer solstice, we, which we just saw. Um, that's good old me uh, with the final heave-ho, actually putting it up there. Um, and this is the, uh, uh, the architect, uh, David Barrett, from uh, the, the, uh, the lead architect for the building uh, on his first experience seeing this. And uh, uh, this was uh, the winter solstice light. And um, this is uh, the light as it looks on the floor in the sanctuary. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's uh, basically a close-up of what we see there. Um, uh, talking about the energy system here, um, it was installed by Bright Street. Uh, and it's a 56.72 kilowatt system. It fills most of the roof and uh, most of the usable part of the roof, 179 modules, three arrays. Um, it generates about uh, 85 to 86,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year. Um, it was commissioned in June, just about a month ago. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, this is where I'm going to hand off to Milt. But Financing this is hard for any commercial building. It's hard for a homeowner. Um, it's especially difficult for a church. It's especially difficult for a church. And we set out uh, our objective uh, to try to make this happen was to uh, make it happen in such a way so that the church was never paying more for its net zero system than it would if it continued to pay Excel to rent energy. So um, we considered several pathways, and uh, one was a power purchase agreement, a very common method of getting solar in place. We considered uh, a version of power purchase agreement called a prepaid or deposit power purchase agreement. I'm not going to go into details on this, and we'll have Q&A later, or we can talk while we're munching on local food about that. But uh, a prepaid PPA. Uh, we considered an outright purchase. We considered PACE financing. PACE financing is an awesome kind of financing for a nonprofit or for any commercial building, but it comes at a cost. And we um, came to the conclusion um, that we could fund this with what we describe as community funding. And we used both impact investing and contribution. And what I mean by that is we had members contribute very low-cost loans, loans that were below 2% interest. And we also had uh, folks make uh, contributions to the uh, project, and about 50-50. And with that, I'm going to hand off to my, my, my partner in crime up here, Milt Hetrick, and he's going to talk a little bit more about how we actually uh, resolve the financing, and then uh, more about the system and, uh, and some of the analytics we're doing on it. Well, good evening. Glad to see so many people here this evening. And um, we are uh, pleased to be able to try to explain to you how we actually built a net zero church. It wasn't easy. And quite frankly, we're not even sure how it happened because there were times during the last couple years when the advocates for this little project uh, were ready to just hang it up and say, this is too difficult. We can't get there from here. But uh, for some reason, we supported each other and persisted and look what we've got. So we're really proud of uh, what happened even though we don't fully understand how we did it. So uh, just as a preface, I guess what I'd like to do 
is um, uh, before we get into explaining how we built it, explain why we built it. And there's probably two main sources of motivation for doing what we did. One is what you might call uh, a motivation based in um, ethics and morality and faith-based uh, type information, type motivation. And the other would be just the fact that many of us in this congregation uh, believe in science. And we are either from a, a scientific perspective or whatever, and so we use evidence-based information to tell us that our current behavior is not necessarily uh, in right relationship with our planet. And we need to do something about it, and fortunately that we can. The universe has given us all the solutions that we need if we just have the will to implement them. So with those two forces in play, when you combine morality and ethics and uh, science-based type information to have the real facts of how the universe works, you can bring about change, and it's kind of amazing what emerges from this, and uh, what you see around you is an example. So we learned that something does emerge, and what I like to do is borrow a phrase from a retired biologist, uh, Ursula Good, uh, Goodenough. Uh, she came up with this term called emergence, which is a creation of something more from nothing but something more complex from nothing but something that already exists. And that's what kind of happened here. It's another example is a situation where you take two plus two and end up with five. Uh, I don't want to minimize the, the issues that we had along the way because we come from a congregation that has a number of outspoken people who are diverse in their thinking and uh, this is probably true of all UU type congregations, but we figured out somehow a way in which we could manage our differences, uh, come to a common uh, set of values and proceed. So um, let me just give you a little backstory before we get into explaining how we did it. We'll talk a little bit about who the people are that were involved and just mention briefly another important um, process that we put in play, not officially, but we tried to reframe things. Uh, for example, um, the words fossil fuel, we try to use a phrase ancient hydrocarbons instead, because when you think of a fuel, what do you do with a fuel? Well, of course you burn it. But that same black stuff that's ancient can also be used for other things. And we've got some examples of some black plastic pipe that we actually used as part of the geothermal system that was made from petroleum. So if you stop using the uh, frame of fossil fuel and use a different term for this substance, you start to focus on other applications for this same natural resource. There, we can go on and on about reframing, but George Lakoff is the expert linguist uh, that we borrowed a lot of uh, ideas from. As John pointed out, uh, this particular project was a project within a project. So we were only about 10% of the major rebuilding project of four and a half million dollars. So whether or not that was an advantage to us or a disadvantage is still to be determined. Because on one hand, we had some infrastructure available for uh, managing contracts and dealing with contractors. But on the other hand, we found that there was a lot of scheduling issues. Normally, the geothermal folks, for example, would come out and they'd spend a week drilling holes and putting pipes in the ground move into the building, uh, change out the furnaces, put in heat pumps, and in another week they'd be gone. Well, it didn't work that way because they had to work around the other trades. And so their work was actually drawn out for 
six months or more. So I'm not sure that uh, being part of a bigger project is necessarily an advantage, but then again, there were some. These are just some key steps that uh, we'll just say a few words about that we felt were relevant in how to uh, build a, a, a zero, a net zero church. One thing that we found we were fortunate enough to start out with was a core of what we'll call environmental activists, but it was only six or eight people that really uh, focused on environmental issues and climate change issues and things like that. So they became the initial energy and spark to make the, pro the project happen. Fortunately, uh, we had folks like Jonathan Orms in the, in the back, who a retired NASA scientist, also taught uh, the physics of climate change uh, at DU. So we had resident experts and uh, John knew everything there was to know about solar, so we had a resident expert there. We didn't know very much about geothermal. In fact, we didn't really know anything except um, one of us uh, happened to have geothermal in our home, uh, me, and I could at least spell the word, so that's about as far as it went, though, as far as expertise. But that was an important uh, element in the, um, in the process. The second thing is it was important to do our homework to understand what the actual energy needs of the church were. So obviously we had to go back and recover a year's worth of energy use and understand that. <clears throat> and then use uh, you know, some analysis to figure out what size solar system and what size geothermal system we needed to really think about here. <clears throat> And uh, during this process, we could start to see resistance among the board of trustees, the staff, even other congregants, that we were biting off more than we could chew when we talked about an energy system, meaning both solar and geothermal. In other words, getting rid of all burning in the, in the church. <clears throat> so this third box just indicates that this process required education and um, informing uh, our colleagues and other congregants, as well as the board of trustees and staff, and the building committee <clears throat> of what this was all about. We got all kinds of pushback, like, well, geothermal is too risky. So we had to educate them that it's nothing different than what's in your refrigerator at home, except and it's been around for 100 years, the technology, except they've come up with a new wrinkle, putting a reversing valve in, so that instead of just cooling, you can also use the same heat pump to heat. So anyway, it was things like that that just required education and information, and we were dealing with uh, intelligent people, and so it just took some time to get them on board and address all their questions. So it was helpful to have a list of frequently asked questions put together with the ready answers so that um, people who had questions could just refer to them. Uh, as John pointed out, one of the key factors was to develop what we called a re uh, revenue neutral financial model, meaning to the board of trustees, to the staff and, well, to all members, there wasn't going to be a change in our church budget. The operating budget would remain the same, so that's why we call it revenue neutral. We didn't have to ask for more pledges or more contributions or whatever. Uh, that, that took us a while to figure out. Uh, we got some input from board members. We had a number of board members who were really proponents and really assisted us along the way. So we learned early on that we had to come in with an offer that was basically um, one that didn't impact the church budget. And John alluded to that. Then, of course, we had to solicit funds. And uh, Jonathan, in particular, was someone who um, was not 
shy in terms of approaching people and asking for money, and that was crucial. So you need those kind of people on your team as well. Uh, we had a number of meetings with the board, the trustees. Uh, we had town meetings and seminars and workshops and things like that that we'll talk about in a minute. And the, the good part was that when we went to these people in positions of power that we had to convince this was a good idea, we went with the message that we were going to be living our values and we were going to not impact the budget and we were going to be 100% sustainable. Now that, that had a ring to it that people could uh, perk up over. Uh, the next step that was, we felt important was to select the right uh, third parties to assist us. In other words, the architect firm that was selected, uh, Barrett Studios up in Boulder, they had already worked with Jefferson Unitarian Church for some of their builds and were familiar with geothermal and solar. Uh, it's kind of an embarrassing story, but um, I think it was in 2015, I was invited to go up to Boulder to talk to the architects and see what they thought about incorporating geothermal into their design. And so I went up and I had this pitch and, you know, tried to show that, oh, Ikea has done it and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the presentation, um, Sam, the one of the architects we were talking to says, oh, yeah, we, uh, we put a system like that in for JUC. <laughs> oh, so I had just kind of wasted a half hour of his life. But anyway, we found architects that were like-minded and we tried to make sure that the contractors that they selected were certified uh, and one of the types of certifications is the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. Uh, but there are other certificates as well. So you had to have to make sure, since this isn't that well applied yet, the geothermal portion, you do want some people with experience. And they're, they're out there, you just have to look for them. And we also found it was useful to hire a commissioning agent, an independent firm that really understood this hardware because those of us in the congregation, although we may have been retired scientists and engineers, et cetera, we really didn't have the day-to-day -day experience with this technology. So hiring some experts, I think was money well spent. And then finally, we'll just touch briefly on the importance of putting in a monitoring system so you can really understand what you have, how it's functioning, how it's operating, and if there might be something wrong. Because these systems are getting more and more complex, um, uh, so you do need to, to have some monitoring equipment. And we weren't smart enough to build that into the, the scope of the original contracts. So who, who are we? Well or who is involved. Uh, we have about 450 adult members, and it turned out that uh, only about 40-some were actually involved in the funding <coughs> process. Uh, only about 12 uh, contributed loans, and uh, the rest provided donations. But uh, you can see you don't need the whole congregation to pull this off but you do need, in this case, like 10%. Uh, obviously, the senior minister had inputs, the board of trustees, there was a building committee for the major $4.5 million project that we reported to, so to speak. We had to convince the building committee of this, that this was a good approach uh, before we could move forward. Uh, our little group of six or eight people that we call the Green First Task Force uh, was a subset of the, our social, social justice committee. So I think other churches have similar structures. And of course then the other people involved were our contractors and subcontractors. 
as I mentioned before, it's important to do your homework. And I've put up a number of things here that I'm not going to go through necessarily, but it is possible for laymen to do their homework and scope out what's really required. There's a lot of information available on the internet. And um, as you can see uh, near the bottom, we just simply went on the internet to NREL's uh, PV Watts program to help us define how big a solar system we needed. And then that allowed us to check whether or not we had enough roof space. Uh, things were starting to come together. Uh, initially, our old building was so poor from an energy uh, use standpoint that we were leaking energy out in every nook and cranny, so to speak. So we sort of overestimated the amount of energy that we needed. Fortunately, the architects designed a much more efficient building and added insulation and new windows, and John talked about this. But we cut our heating and cooling needs by about 50 percent. So that meant we don't need quite as much solar to drive our heat pumps, et cetera. So it turned out initially we thought we didn't have enough roof space. It, and the, uh, the final calculations indicated we just barely make it. Um, anyway, there are ways to estimate the, the size of your geothermal system. You just need to go back. And if you're transitioning from propane or natural gas or whatever, fuel oil, just look at the rating of your existing furnaces. And the geothermal furnaces have identical ratings, so or the geothermal heat pumps. So you just have to replace them with an equivalent uh, heat pump. So that gives you a sense of the size of your geothermal system. And there's rules of thumb, like the, la <clears throat> the last line there shows that um, one ton requires about, oh, 100 to 150 feet of pipe in the ground. And the going rate this, at this point to drill the hole and fill the hole with the black plastic pipe and grout it, et cetera, is about 15 to $17 a foot. So you can kind of get a sense of how much your geothermal system is going to cost you. Now, it's important to do what we didn't, didn't do initially, and that was to acknowledge that being a nonprofit and not, have, not having the ability to take advantage of tax benefits that a homeowner has or a for-profit business has, it's sort of a disadvantage for churches and universities and other nonprofits to make this transition to renewable energy. But it's still profitable. There's still, as we've said, money to be made, particularly in the solar area, not so much so in the geothermal because natural gas is still so inexpensive. But if you keep the two together, you combine the two systems into one total energy system, the net result is still a system that is going to result in financial gain. Um, it's important to bring this out because there were so many times down the road when the going got tough and we just couldn't scrape together enough money, it seemed. And the first inclination was to bail out with the geothermal and say, let's just do solar. We can get a third party in here and it won't even cost us anything. Well, that's not quite true. What that really says is there's no upfront money, but your financial gain is being sucked up by that third party that's putting their front end money in. And so the church doesn't really benefit as much, you know, if you use that third party for your capital as if you figure out a way to uh, assemble that capital yourself and buy the equipment. So we found that there was some magic in coming up with a plan that essentially came to the Board of Trustees with an offer that they couldn't refuse. And so we'll talk about that just a little bit. But 
The first element was, of course, to say that you're not going to have to change the church operating budget. I mean, that was, that was almost a mandatory requirement that we had to meet. <clears throat> but fortunately, we found, uh, as we went through this, that we were able to identify people who had similar values, similar ethics, and whether you're in a Unitarian Universalist church or a Catholic church or Buddhist temple or whatever, you'll find that you're among like-minded people and every world religion has a creation story and a creation care story. Different terminology, slightly different worldviews, but um, my partner, Gail, in the back of the room, a retired UU minister, and she's put together a, a collage, basically, of the world religions, and you'll see this in the basement, uh, and their perspective of um, how to care for our planet. So no matter what church you're from, or even if you're not, you can find like-minded people that uh, uh, have their own terminology for creation care. So, as I indicated, part of the process is education. We, I don't know how many workshops we had, seminars. We had three town hall style meetings after Sunday morning programs. We had one session that was called Geothermal 101 because a number of people were telling us, we don't understand what geothermal is. You know, we, do you drill down a thousand feet or two miles or something? And no, 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 it's, this is low temperature geothermal. And so we found it was important to at least give a geothermal 101 seminar. And that seemed to, to help bring people along and not be so concerned about this technology. Uh, it helps to that there was a little bit of background with our congregation and I know this is also true of the other churches in the area, the UU churches in the area, who are also uh, Green Sanctuary certified. So Tom Abood in the back is going to be talking about local food and sustainable living, um, actually led the charge for us to get us certified. And there's quite a bit of uh, activity and thought and change in behavior that was required to get this certification. So we were able to build on that. Now, whether or not that's essential, I don't know, but it certainly helped when it came to this project. Another thing that um, we tried or attempted to bring into play was this idea of externalities. I'm going to start talking a little bit about finance and economics. Um, I'll preface all this by saying we failed. We tried to introduce the idea of externalities and show that the economic system that we're currently using to make our decisions um, is flawed because it doesn't consider social costs. And so the price of natural gas and oil, et cetera, is not exactly the true cost. So I cited one article that I found very valuable. It's done by the Harvard Medical Center, Ms. Paul Epstein. And actually, you might see a name near the end of that list, Leslie Glustrom, that everybody knows. She was on that team. Uh, they made an attempt to see what the true cost, the full cost, uh, is for the life cycle of coal, using coal to generate electricity. And it's a great report because they looked at 12 different um, externalized costs, social costs that are real, but not embedded in the cost of electricity. And, you know, including neurological damage due to the release of mercury into the air and how it affects the, the growth of our children. Uh, COPD or respiratory illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. There's 12 different medical related items that they attempt to monetize, tried to put a, uh, a dollar value on what this cost really is. 
the conclusion was that we pay about 11 cents a kilowatt, 12 cents a kilowatt hour for our electricity. Uh, right now here in Colorado, still a, a good percentage of Excel's energy is made with coal. They're transitioning, but that electricity from coal should really, a true cost would be more like 27 to 36 cents a kilowatt hour if you have included all these ignored or externalized costs. We tried to make this case to the board of trustees that this is a no-brainer. We're gonna be making lots and lots of money uh, if you look at the true cost of using fossil fuel. They didn't buy that, uh, not one bit. In fact, we were almost thrown out of the room for insisting on it. The other thing that we tried out was to tell them that we foresee the advent of a carbon tax, a carbon pollution tax or whatever in the future. That's the only way we're gonna really significantly change behavior. And um, Jonathan tried to present that, I think, to the board, and he was uh, rejected as well. So we weren't allowed to bring that into play, but by putting in your own uh, rooftop solar and geothermal heating and cooling, you're now separated from these fluctuations in the cost of fossil fuel. So even if there is a carbon tax, you're not buying that fossil fuel and paying the tax, so you're sort of immune. Um, anyway, we weren't successful in getting that across either, but it is a fact. <clears throat> That's right, we tried, we tried to convince the staff and the board that, uh, well, first I think we started with a 4% inflation or escalation in energy price, because we thought the industry was using that number. They, they didn't buy that at all. <clears throat> I think we finally settled on 3%, and that was begrudgingly, but we were allowed to at least, I think, escalate energy costs a little bit. But it's important to put together a spreadsheet model that shows your cash flow over a period of 20 to 25 years. That's, <clears throat> that's how long this equipment lasts. <clears throat> Solar panels are warranted, I think, for, what, 20 years, John, or something like that. And um, the geothermal system, well, the pumps are similar to regular furnaces, but the heat pumps, but the pipes that are in the ground made of that black plastic high-density polyethylene, or whatever it's called, um, are warranted, I think, for 50 years, and they say, well, it could be 200. So it's like gas pipes in the ground or whatever. The infrastructure is going to be there for quite a while. Uh, but you do need this spreadsheet model to help you understand all the costs and see what your cash flow looks like. So. We have those available. We actually borrowed some from uh, St. Paul's, St. John's Episcopal up in Boulder. We got, John found them and uh, we used some of the experience they had in uh, funding a solar project for their church. And there are clever ways that you can bring a third party in and I won't talk about that at the moment. Because we decided, as John pointed out, although you called it community funding. Uh, I simply call it member funding. You know, the church members provided all the capital either through donations, which were tax deductible for them, or through these low interest loans, um, which we considered socially responsible investments. Now they're only gonna get one and a half percent interest on those socially responsible investments, but they're low risk, and they're certainly uh, for a good cause that they can quantify and see the results of. So in this spreadsheet, um, we've got several sections. We've got fossil fuel energy system costs. We've got renewable energy uh, system costs. So what we did, we looked at our electric 
bill and our gas bill, totaled them up, and we put in some replacement costs for the furnaces, and the sum was $17,000 a year that the church is paying. So that's, that's what we had to work with. Um, because that's what we're paying now, and that would escalate at 3% annually. And this is the escalation of the, the church bill, church utility bill, over the next 20 years. So the, the model allows us to take the cost of the solar electric system, the geothermal system, which ended up being around $440,000, and then figure out how, with a combination of donations and loans, we could come up with that capital. And it turned out that um, the board limited us to loans amounting to $240,000. And uh, in other words, they didn't, they didn't want us to obviously go above that uh, current utility bill number, which is what we were trying to do anyway. But uh, what that tells you then is, is that if, if you set a limit at the loans, that tells you how many donations you have to have to balance the spreadsheet and make it work. Now you could do it the other way around. You could say, well, we got 100,000 in donations, so we're gonna need 340,000 in loans and work it that way, but you're then, your repayment uh, schedule is more. It would not be revenue neutral. You'd have to go back and ask for an increase in the church operating budget. So what it amounts to is the church still writes a check for $17,877 to this group of people that loaned them the money. It's a little partnership that Tom Abu formed and there are 12 people in it. And instead of writing the checks to Excel, they write the checks to that partnership. And the budget stays the same. And then Tom, once a year, I guess, will distribute uh, the funds uh, as repayment uh, over 15 years with 1.5% uh, interest tacked onto it. Now, uh, we tried to they kept trying to get us to take that number down because they had another budget issue of $40,000 deficit or something. But we were trying to tell them, look, you're trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip because this only amounts to 2% of your actual total budget. The, the church budget is approaching a million dollars and they're only spending 2% on utilities. So trying to squeeze us down didn't make a whole lot of sense because they weren't gonna get well uh, just by uh, getting more money out of us. But anyway, that was the internal conflict that we had to manage. It took some effort. There were times when we thought we weren't gonna get there from here, but uh, somehow we did it. So graphically, what this looks like is uh, right now, the green represents what the church is paying, about 17000 and it does go up a little bit. No, it stays constant um, for 15 years, and then it drops off because the loans are paid. If we had stuck with Excel Energy, we would continue to increase and pay that much. So you can see the notch that's out of there is just financial gain for the church. They like that. Um, Soliciting funds don't need to go into that, but as I said, we were able to put together a story that, that showed that we were doing this for ethical, moral reasons as well as financial reasons, and both were good. Uh, it was a process of getting approval from the, the board and we did require approval from the whole congregation, and I might just skip ahead and say, uh, in November of 2016, we had a congregational meeting, and it was unanimous to go ahead with this energy system proposal. We were just floored uh, that we had gotten there, but um, 
as I say, it was a revenue neutral, so for the church members, it didn't really impact them at all. We talked about uh, getting experience and certified uh, contractors and commissioning agents are, we think, important. <clears throat> what I'd like to do it now quickly is show you the monitoring system that systems that we put in place. There are two. One focuses on the power usage, the energy usage in the church as it is, and the other focuses on the actual operational data from the geothermal itself. So um, the eGauge system, it's a company up in Boulder that most of you probably are familiar with. Um, they focus on uh, the power consumed by different um, uh, appliances and things like that, like the furnaces and the lighting, etc. This other monitoring system called the Web Energy Logger Well uh, was something that we learned about from our geothermal contractor, but it focuses just on amassing large amounts of temperature data. So we have some sample temperature sensors over there, and we have a, um, also the device that's used for the e-gauge, it's called a current transformer, that you clamp around uh, circuits that you want to measure. They're fairly straightforward and easy to install. So uh, that, those are the two systems we put in, and I'd like to show you them. Um, just some examples, and I'll come back and, and get them in real time. But uh, those of you who are familiar with the e-gauge system know that the green part is represents the power that was generated by our solar system. So um, this was a kind of a ratty day, a cloudy day. So you can see it's not a very nice parabolic profile or whatever. The red indicates the amount of usage within the church. And the spikes typically um, are the heat pumps coming on because it's been very hot and they've been running a lot. So um, when a heat pump comes on, it takes, uh, well, you can see a spike here. It's uh, two, three kilowatts of power that it draws when it, it comes on. There's a compressor and a blower motor. The second monitoring system, the well system, uh, allows us to kind of visualize what's going on with the geothermal system and the temperatures. So what we have here is a row of devices called energy recovery ventilate ventilators and a row of 10 heat pumps in this building. So we have the first three are for the sanctuary in the round part of the building. Uh, one for the offices, a couple in the middle, the Friendship Hall portion, et cetera. So we're in an area that's being serviced probably by these two heat pumps here. This diagram simply shows what's in the basement, and you'll see it later. But the heat pumps that go into the, I mean, the pipes that go into the ground uh, bring uh, two inch pipes into the building. They come together in a three inch pipe. There's a hydraulic separator here that allows the fluid to circulate here and here, or just go right straight through. Um, th these, there's temperature sensors here and here to provide those temperatures as well as the temperature coming out of each of these three circuits from the ground loop. This is an example of the e-gauge output and it was for what, uh, July 19th. <clears throat> it shows this profile here, uh, dotted line says, uh, see we've checked that we want heat pump number four uh, displayed. So it draws this dotted line and that's a heat pump that services the office area. It came on at the beginning of the day around eight o'clock and stayed on 
constantly until the folks went home and it went into the night reset. Well, they're not supposed to do this. This is an indication that that heat pump, it's only a two ton heat pump, for that office space is undersized. So by putting the system in, well, first of all, it's in the crawl space and we couldn't hear it. We really didn't know how much it was operating, but it turns out that this is a, just an indication that there's a, a problem with our design and we're gonna have to work this out and probably add another two ton heat pump to it to augment it for the, the hot days. So this was a, you know, a mid 90 degree day. So we were really using it. Now, if it gets below 90, then this heat pump can handle the demand. But um, it's important to understand what's going on with your system. Now, this, these spikes are from uh, heat pump number six, and it goes on and goes off and on and on. And, you know, that's, that's typical. So that's not a problem. Okay, this is real time data from the e gauge, and that was today. So you can see we had some cloudy weather right around, what were they, one, two, two o'clock or something, clouded over, and then intermittent sun after that. So you can also see from the graph, it's supposed to look like this on a nice sunny day. And you can see that we're generating significantly more than what we're using. That's a good thing. And that's what the system is designed for. During the summer, with the long days and the high sun, we're generating energy credits because we're going to need them in the winter. And um, it's doing exactly what we've designed to do. Now, whether or not the numbers are going to come out after a 12-month period, we don't know yet. So. John's putting some money on, we're not quite gonna make it, and I'll, I'll say we do. <laughs> so what you can do with this software is you can um, specify different time intervals. So we had it set at one day, now I clicked on one week, and so you, you can see we had some good Sundays, relatively good Sundays, um, but there, we've had some nasty weather too, you, you can see here. So you can, you can pick a month, uh, three months or whatever uh, with this software. It's really cool and it, you can get this uh, on your smartphone right now. I mean, everyone who has the URL uh, can see this. So that's the URL right up there. Um, if you want it, want to see this for some strange reason, see me afterwards. And you can see both of these monitoring systems. So it's pretty transparent. And we think that might have an impact on our contractors. They seem to be very responsive, knowing that their systems are in full view of the public. And if they're not operating correctly, you know, their names are associated with this. So I don't know if that really has an impact or not. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How much did you get that Cal Energy to pay for your renewable energy credits? Um, well, we, uh, we were awarded uh, at the 4.75 cent level, four, uh, uh, four and three quarter cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, was the award we got based on the time that we submitted our uh, submission. And, uh, and and that is for 20 years. That's what you sell for 20 years? Yes. Uh, well, you know, no, actually, no, that, we, we get that compensation for every unit of energy we generate on site. They get to keep the energy. Yeah, so we get to use it, and, and they're required to pay us because they then become the owner of the renewable energy credit. It's a little bit complicated, but, but money-wise, it, 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 it really makes or breaks one of these projects to be able to get that, uh, for them to purchase that credit is important. I think we're not going to have or tax money? No, uh, well, for, res for, um, for residential, it is, 
uh, a half a penny. But for commercials, it's still in the four or seven. Yes. Yeah, on your uh, envelope, your coupons, what are values that you go for in your walls and in your ceiling? Because that derives how much your uh, Yeah, I, I don't know if I can give you a crisp answer to that, but we, we did use, uh, we maximized things. For example, the, this is an old part of the building, and we put uh, 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 an enormous amount, I think it was like eight inches of new insulation on the top roof before the solar went on this roof. It was one of the reasons we had to delay the solar that had to get done first. Uh, but that's only one example. In all of the new construction areas, it was built in 2016 standards, uh, and, and, and we maximized wherever we could. So I apologize, I don't have the numbers for you, but I just know that we built to the highest standard we could build. We're going to be talking with the um, <clears throat> mechanical designer who put together the heat load model. So I'll ask that question. Because we have to understand what went wrong in that office area and why we have an undersized heat pump. So there's some more communication going on there. OK, um, things that didn't work. Well, we talked about some of these already. As I said, we didn't get any traction on this idea that the economic model that we're using to make decisions is broken and that we really need to fix it so that we know the true cost of things. Uh, no traction there, no, no, that wasn't really considered. We used the classical economics, and it still made sense, dollars and cents. So we're lucky. Um, one of the things that we tried to do, too, was to point out that the way our church was previously operating, it was doing harm by burning fossil natural gas and uh, dumping greenhouse gas emissions into the, the atmosphere. And it's hard for folks to realize, because they can't see it, that their church, something they revere, obviously, is doing harm. But it's a fact. The way we were operating, we were altering the heat balance, the energy balance of our planet, and affecting the future of our children, grandchildren, certainly. Uh, if any of you try to emulate some of this stuff, I hope you have more success than we did in some of these areas. Uh, we never seem to get any good response on this concept of the urgency of bringing about change in behavior. And to us, who well, I guess this is thanks to Jonathan, too, who taught us a lot about the physics of climate change. If you go to some of the IPCC reports and you look at the carbon budget and the rate at which we're dumping carbon into the atmosphere, we don't have a lot of budget left. If we want to keep a 1.5C warmer planet, we're going to have to stop burning stuff probably within 10, 15 years. So we just couldn't seem to get any traction as far as this is a problem we need to address now. It's not adequate to have a plan that puts something in, in place 20 years from now. That just isn't going to work. You've got to, got to say, stop burning now. Uh, as I said, we didn't have any uh, response to the carbon tax idea. And we didn't really have a whole lot of, um, I guess, affirmation in trying to reframe the problem. But that's still something that needs to be worked on to, to allow us to think a little bit differently of what the options really are out there. So um, the other thing that was a little bit irritating probably to John and myself, since a lot of us now uh, drive plug-in cars, we just couldn't get anyone interested in putting in a charging station, not even one. And, you know, we even went so far as to say, look, a lot of the carbon emissions that this church is responsible for comes from the staff that drives their gasoline cars to work. And, and in a sense, uh, the church has, has to think about that as well. 
And if we put in charging stations and sort of encouraged our staff to think about a plug-in vehicle for their next vehicle, uh, that would be in the right direction. But anyway, that didn't go anywhere either. I, I would say that we did uh, pre-wire for that, and so we are prepared to put in charging stations at a later date, and there's a section of the parking lot that's a comment that will accommodate that. So uh, we, we, we did do uh, the, the, the easy and expensive. So we got the, the conduit in. Yeah. yeah. Okay, conclusions. Uh, transitioning to 100% sustainable energy system does provide a financial gain, even using the broken economic system. Uh, we found that taking a look at all the greenhouse gas emission sources that you have and keeping them bundled together was an effective way to get the finances together and all that. Now, we did have a a small failure. We were not responsible for one aspect of the remodeling program, and that was food preparation. So embarrassingly to some of us, we have a kitchen that has a gas stove. Um, we talked about use, using experienced, uh, certified designers, etc. And seriously consider getting your capital from within your organization um, through donations and member loans, rather than going to Wall Street and paying the commercial rates of six, five or six percent. We found with the spreadsheet models that we had when we put in the commercial interest rates, it broke it. It broke the models. We couldn't get there from here, but if we just had a minimal amount of interest, to more or less keep up with inflation, then it worked. So that's kind of critical too. If you go out to a bank or to Wall Street and get your capital, uh, that's a tough one. So, okay, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Tom Abood. Uh, he's our, our resident expert on sustainable food. I'd like to welcome everyone here as well to our awesome facility. And I wanted to say if, just a couple of things about the project we did here. You know, it, it's really what I'd like you to take out of this is, you know, what is our relationship to nature? What is our relationship to money? And do we buy into the myth of economic growth, infinite economic growth on a planet with finite resources? And those are what really shape the way I live and invest and the way this church has come together. This financing package we put together, to me, and I actually am an investor, made a loan and I get one and a half percent over 15 years. To me, that is one of the best investments I've made. I'm investing in community, planet, and I'm getting a financial return. It's not like a donation, I made donations as well, but you could look at it from perspective of even if I got 0% on my loan, I'm getting 100% return because it's not a donation. So we used a couple different buckets to put it together. But it's really important for all of us to start looking at a different paradigm of what our money's doing. And we can't keep looking at our money just making money. It's got to really serve more of the the general welfare, the common good, what, what, is our, what is the purpose of money after all? So when, when we talk about local food, my passions are local food, local energy, you know, mobility, how are we getting around transportation wise, and everything is interconnected. You know, what you're doing is basically decentralizing the power grid. We have lots of power producers out there I have solar on my roof, and I suspect everyone out here does as well. Well, with local food, it's the same concept. It's a lot of small producers instead of the giant corporate agribusiness. And that's really how we're going to work this out. It's going to have to be on the local level where we're all supporting one another, energy, food, water, finance. And so... You know, hopefully you didn't come here looking for a dinner because we're just having some samples of some local food 
everything I could get at the farmer's market, and uh, summer squash is really cranking up in my garden, so I made some hummus out of summer squash with some veggies and pita and then some awesome Rocky Ford melons and, and, and cantaloupe. And, you know, really food, we have commodi commoditized food, and we really need to get back into the more spiritual concept of food, that it's really breaking bread and community and, and looking at everything that goes into good, healthy food. So with that, you know, thank you for coming, and we'll go from there.